I'm going to sit back here. And I thought it would be interesting to have two semi-disparate people who are coming in to healthcare in slightly different ways and similar ways share a, a conversation. It might be a disaster. <laughs> I don't know how it's going to go. This isn't planned. I don't have a set series of questions. Uh, three people, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, and we'll see how it goes. What do you think about or think about what you do that is similar and different than the gentleman on my left? Well, first let me ask you, I, we both prepared some slides. Would you prefer us not to show them? For the moment. Okay. What's different? Um, I think I tend to focus more initially on the science to prove how powerful these simple changes in lifestyle can be. You know, people think it has to be a new drug or a new laser or something really high tech and expensive to be powerful. And we've tried to show that, uh, you know, these simple choices that we make in our lives each day can make a powerful difference. Deepak is focusing on the psychosocial, the emotional, and the spiritual dimensions. But the, the funny thing is, is that he also does a lot with diet and lifestyle. And the real, the real essence of our work is the psychosocial, the emotional, and the spiritual. That how people can use the experience of suffering as a doorway and as a catalyst for transforming their lives. And the same question. I think uh, Dean is a real doctor, and I'm a witch doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you very much. That's the end of the session. <laughs> Which doctor are you? Uh, no, I, I rely on Dean's research to substantiate and uh, reinforce what I feel is really a new paradigm that needs to come into medicine, which is a consciousness-based understanding of our biology. Uh, we are conscious beings. We think, we feel, we remember, we have emotions, insights, intuition, creativity, inspiration, choice making. We fall in love, we have joy, we have connectivity. All these experiences are metabolized into our biology. And uh, we're not looking at that mostly. And Dean is a pioneer in that he's looking at the human biological organism more as an ecosystem in the way it really, truly needs to be looked at. So I, I steal his work to uh, make a living. <laughs> <laughs> and people like uh, Dr. Andrew Weil, who's here as well. Are you making a living? A good one. <laughs> <laughs> and he's helping other people live, as, which is the best kind of living to be making. And you too. What's, what's, your, what's the thing you want to do next? Not what you've just done, not the last book, but what's the next thing you want to do? Well, I've been working with um, Mark Hyman, who's here, and Mike Royzen and some others to try to... <laughs> Hello. Sorry. I do like your hat. Yes. Um, to try to change what's going on with health reform. Uh, you know, we... We're spending so much time on uh, increasing the coverage of the 46 million people who need it, which of course we need to do. But if we just do more bypasses and angioplasties and radical prostatectomies without changing what we do, then costs are gonna go up exponentially. So we have these painful choices, which is really threatening the viability of health reform. We're trying to say, look, you know, if we can show people how, three quarters of the 2.1 trillion in healthcare costs come from chronic diseases, most of which can be prevented or even reversed through lifestyle. And so we've been trying to get them to do that. The problem is, is that the Congressional Budget Office says that, oh, lifestyle is prevention, and that's just going to make people live longer, so it's going to cost more money, like that's a bad thing. Um, and we're trying to say, yes, that's true, but it can also be a treatment, and it works as well or often even better or synergistically with drugs and surgery. So we're trying, I, you know, I used to think that we were uh, practicing evidence-based medicine, but so often it's reimbursement-driven. And if we can change reimbursement, then we can change everything. And how are you going to get that message across? Or how do you think? Is it in, in, in your life, you've, you've, you've become a star in your area as the gentleman behind me. And you, what do you think or what have you found has the most impact? Talking at a place like this, being on Larry King, uh, doing a, uh, a book, 
Uh, is there anything that most that helps you with any clarity or any coming back uh, that you think is a better way of explaining your message, or is it now a world that's just viral and things get out? From here, people Twitter and they send something on a Facebook, or they, or it goes on TED Talks or something of that sort. I, I think it's all important, and I think what you're doing is really important because it's not only bringing people together to exchange information, but as I'll be talking about uh, a little bit later, anything that creates a sense of community is healing. And so the the, the TED Med conference is not only a source of information for people, both those who attend and through the web. But that the reason people come here, as opposed to just you know downloading the talks, is that the community and connection are themselves healing, and that I think is ultimately what makes them transformative. How was your mess? The same Sorry question. To just, start off with, I'll ask the same I, question. I think the most exciting time <laughs> of the time that we're living in is that we have a new technology, uh, the technology of cyberspace that can very rapidly reach critical mass. And if we want to bring about a transformation in healthcare, then we have to use that technology. We have to let go of our traditional ways of uh, having a conversation. Uh, what the world out there is a projection of our collective conversation. So this conversation is very important, as are conversations on Twitter and Facebook and all of cyberspace. I think this is the collective cloning of our soul at the moment. Our Consciousness is cloning itself through cyberspace. The other day I got one message on Twitter, you know, I, I'm looking for a good relationship. How do I find the right person? And so I was boarding a plane and I tweeted back, said, instead of looking for the right person, can you become the right person? Within 60 seconds, that was with 250,000 people, and by the time I landed, which was an hour's flight, it was with five million people. So, you know, we have to change our memes. Memes are uh, like ideas that replicate, and they have to infect the collective mind, and we have to really see that healing in its ultimate sense is many things. It's our physical healing, emotional healing, but spiritual healing, but it's healing the ecosystem. It's uh, looking at social justice. It's looking at radical poverty and the fact that you have 50% of the world living on less than $2 a day. It's looking at war and terrorism. And we have terrible metaphors to handle all this. We say war on terrorism, war on poverty, war on drugs, war on AIDS, war on war, which is war on terrorism. Uh, we are creative beings. And you know, as Einstein said, no problem will ever be solved at the level of consciousness at which it was created. We have to change that conversation, move it to a new level, and use Twitter and TedMed to reach critical mass. I don't use Twitter. I don't know how to do I'll things. show you <laughs> afterwards. Boy, that would be a tutorial, wouldn't it? <laughs> now, I was thinking of hiring you to Twitter this once, and we could fill up the room and not have anxiety all year. I'll charge you a just... bit, but I'll do it. <laughs> and I would just have to figure where we put the 4,990-whatever-thousand <laughs> people. Really, 5 million people from a Twitter? Yeah, as it spread, yeah, as it, as it got retweeted. Mark Twitters, and he put stuff on. And he saw, I gave a talk the other day in Providence. And there was a Twitter saying something like, what was it? I peed beside... But I just, I, I just got to pee next to Richard Saul Werman. <laughs> and then I decided not to go on Twitter again. But, uh... As I said, we have to change the level of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> the sidebar here was, you're always pissing people off. <laughs> do you Twitter? I do. I've just started to. It's, uh, you know, I'm looking for, I, I use any platform that can help people. Uh, you know, the information itself empowers people. So any way we can get it to people, I'm all for. What's your next book? Uh, my next book is called The Ultimate Happiness Prescription. My current book is called Reinventing the Body, Resurrecting You can't talk about so current books. That's promotion. The next the book. The Ultimate Happiness Prescription. The ultimate, what's, what's, 
the first paragraph, or what's, what is it about? Well, how happiness you is it? the goal. You had to describe it to somebody. Happiness is the goal of all other goals. So there's a science of happiness. Um, uh, there's a, a brain mechanism that some people have when they look at a solution situation, they see it as a problem. Other people have a brain mechanism that look at the same situation, see it as an opportunity. And this, uh, you can influence this brain mechanism. Also, for the research shows that uh, material possessions do not bring happiness. So if you win the lottery today, $20 million, at the end of one year, you'll be as happy or as unhappy as you were before you won the lottery, uh, because you return to your baseline state. Voluntary choices that we make every day, um, what is called intentional activity, is the fastest way to be happy. So if you're in a creative mode, if you are inspired, if you make somebody else happy, then you're happy. In fact, the fastest way to be happy is to make someone else happy. And happiness has health consequences, because when you have a subjective experience of happiness or euphoria, your brain triggers the release of opiates, uh, which are endorphins, catechol, no, sorry, um, uh, um, serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, which enhance self-esteem, make you happy, but also are immunomodulators. They fine-tune the activity of the immune system. So much though we discount the subjective experiences, uh, they are very important for our objective health. We know the biochemistry and physiology of stress, but we've never looked at the opposite. So that's what the book is about. Are you going to be here till the end of the conference? Yes. OK. Dean is going to show a few visuals that he would like to show. You have a few visuals. I'll take a minute to show my visuals. One minute, and he promised five minutes. We're going to be three minutes One over. and a half minutes. We're going to be four minutes over. <laughs> that's my final offer. You know, that's what they did. It's, we're like selling buttons on the street here. Sure. OK, and then we are going to uh, so call it. But they'll both be around. They'll both be around for you to talk with the nature of the beast here. So. Go ahead. Do you want me to take the baby? Oh, no, no, no. Actually, I don't know. I'm not going to take it away. I'm, I didn't mean you are going to give it to me. Sure. Yes, OK. OK, go. I'll just, OK. Wow, I do like your hat. Yeah, OK. So I guess I could just sit down and talk. Actually, I'll stand up. It's easier. So I want to talk about, build on what Deepak was just saying, which is the, the transformative power of lifestyle changes. You know. When most people think about my work, they think about diet. And uh, diet's important, but it's really, for me, it's always been the least interesting aspect of the work. It's really about how we can use the experience of suffering as a doorway for transforming our lives. And what we've been able to show, we've used these very expensive, high-tech, state-of-the-art measures to prove the power of these very low-tech and low-cost and ancient interventions. I'll take her back. I like, I like carrying her. And, uh, and we were able to show that when you make these changes, they occur much more powerfully and much more quickly than people had once realized. That your, your body has a remarkable capacity to begin healing itself and much more quickly than people had once realized. And it's the usual suspects. It's nutrition, stress management, moderate exercise, and psychosocial support. And people have a hard time believing that these simple choices can be so powerful, but they really are. Now, everything that I'll share with you in this 32 years of work that I'm going to summarize in just a few minutes was thought impossible at the time we, before we began doing this work. And it just shows you how dynamic these changes are, how quickly they can improve, and what a meaningful difference they can make. We began by looking at heart disease, and we're able to show that even severe heart disease can be reversed simply by changing diet and lifestyle. We found that uh, this is a picture of a quantitative arteriogram. The upper left is showing the narrowing or the blockage before, and on the upper right, it's, it's wider. And the lower left is a cardiac PET scan. Blue and black is no blood flow at the beginning. The lower right after a year is almost normal. And that had never been shown before. It just shows you how powerful these changes are. When we looked at all the blockages in all the arteries, they got worse and worse in the group that made more moderate changes, better and better in the group that made more intensive changes. We then did a randomized trial in collaboration with Dr. Bill Fair, who at the time was chair of urology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and Dr. Peter Carroll, chair at UCSF. And we found that the progression of early stage prostate cancer can be stopped or slowed or even reversed by making these same kinds of changes. PSA levels came down uh, compared to the control group. Tumor growth in vitro was inhibited 70% in the experimental group versus only 9% in the control group. 
And when we did MR spectroscopy and found that the tumor activity shown in red began to shrink or diminish after just a year, along with the PSA uh, coming down as well. Now, it's not one diet for heart disease, another diet and lifestyle program for prostate cancer, and another one for diabetes. It's the same one. And so when you deal at the fundamental causes, you find that everywhere we look, we found improvements, and including we found changes in gene expression, which was also thought to be uh, unlikely, that after just three months, we found that over 500 genes were changed. In effect, turning on the disease-preventing genes and turning off the genes that promote heart disease, inflammation, and particularly the oncogenes that cause breast and prostate cancer. And we found, losing a heat map, these are the oncogenes. Red is turned on and green is turned off. And you see after just three months how it goes from mostly red to mostly green. Uh, Jeff Dusek at Harvard did a study where they found that meditation alone caused change in gene expression. This is something I'm sure Deepak will want to talk about. And the more, the eight weeks of meditation caused some improvement, uh, the advanced meditators showed even greater improvement. We published a study last year in the uh, Lancet Oncology with Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn, who uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine a few weeks ago for her discovery of telomerase. And telomerase is an enzyme that um, lengthens and repairs damaged telomeres, which are the ends of our chromosomes that control how long we live. And it was found that after just three months, we were able to show a 30% increase in telomerase and thus telomere length. So it's showing genetic evidence now that lifestyle changes actually on a cellular level can help us live longer. Even pharma hasn't been shown to do that. And so in many ways, lifestyle changes are not only as good as drugs and surgery, but in this case, even better, as we often see, or they can be synergistic with it. So our genes are a predisposition, but they're not our fate and we can often overcome them by making bigger changes. Now, that's all really good, but as Einstein said, not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that's meaningful is measurable. And if you talk to the people who go through our programs, they'll say, you know, I got into it because I wanted to open my arteries, but you know, my heart is opening in ways that I really hadn't thought about. And the real epidemic isn't just, lone, isn't just heart disease and, and uh, uh, obesity and cancer, it's depression and loneliness and isolation. And study after study has shown that people who are lonely and depressed are three to seven times more likely to get sick and die prematurely than those who have a sense of love and connection and community, in part because you're more likely to smoke and overeat and drink too much and work too hard and abuse yourself. People say things like, I've got 20 friends in this pack of cigarettes, and they're always there for me, and nobody else is. You're going to take away my 20 friends, what are you going to give me? But also through mechanisms that we don't fully understand. And so anything that promotes isolation and loneliness and depression often leads to patterns of behavior that cause us to get sick, whereas anything that promotes a sense of intimacy is healing. This is my wife, Anne, and our, my son, uh, Lucas, and that kind of intimacy uh, in whatever form is healing. And it helps us understand that the spiritual truths that Deepak alluded to earlier, altruism and compassion and love and, and uh, forgiveness, you know, they're false choices. Is, is it fun for me or is it good for me? Is, am I gonna be selfish or unselfish? And when we realize that these ancient spiritual truths teach us how to transcend these, these differences, this isolation that is at the root of our suffering and our illness, then we can see them in a different light. And so, yeah, it's good to be able to show that we're gonna live longer, but you know, I was profoundly depressed when I was in college, and we can talk about that more if there's time later. If you told me then that I was gonna live longer if I just changed my diet and lifestyle, I'd say, you don't understand, I'm just trying to make it through the day, which a lot of people are. And so, what's personally sustainable is also globally sustainable because uh, livestock, more people, uh, more global warming is caused by livestock consumption than all forms of transportation combined. So here again, when you eat healthier, when you live healthier, it's good for you and good for the planet. And the last slide is that, you know, meditation and these so-called stress management techniques are powerful stress management techniques, but there's so much more than that. You know, the ancient swamis and rabbis and priests and monks and nuns and so on, all the spiritual teachers didn't use those to talk about unclogging their arteries and changing their genes. It can do that, that they're about quieting down our mind and body to experience inner peace and joy and well-being, and ultimately to transcend, to give us the direct experience that on one level we're separate, you know, you're you and I, me. On another level, we're a part of something larger that connects us, and that ultimately is healing in the sense of the root healing, which is to make whole. Yoga is to yoke, to unite, to bring together. These are very ancient truths that we're beginning to rediscover. Thank you. Okay, so based on what Dean has said, I'd like to offer you a new model for looking at human biology. It's a consciousness-based model that your consciousness 
simultaneously differentiates into everything that you call reality. Without consciousness, you can't think, you can't feel, you can't perceive, you can't behave. And so consciousness and your biology are directly linked. And a science that does not look at subjectivity is an incomplete science. And by definition, when you're looking for consciousness, your consciousness is looking for consciousness. So by definition, that's a subjective experience. Any objective understanding of consciousness, even through MRIs and PET scans, is at best inferential. So if you want to be a complete scientist, and I think I can say this to you because I'm in the August of my, I'm in the, uh, what do you call, the uh, third stage of my life, and I consider myself an elder. But if you really want to be a true scientist, then you have to understand your own self. So I'd like to ask you to do something right now. Just as you're listening to me, turn your attention to who's listening. So as you're listening to me, turn your attention to the one who's listening. I hope you feel a still presence. And if you do, that's your core consciousness, which the great spiritual traditions call the soul. And those same traditions say, hold on to that part of yourself, because it's the only thing that's real about you. Everything else is a transient behavior, a pattern of behavior of your consciousness. My new model says that your body is a process in consciousness, not a structure that your body is an energy and information field, part of a larger information field, that your genes are not fixed structures as Jean, uh, has Dean has just showed, that your nervous system is also not fixed. They are expressions of your consciousness that you can change. That everything that we call abstract, love, compassion, insight, intuition, creativity, imagination, all of that, even our experience of time, is actually metabolized into our body processes. So if you are the kind of person who's running out of time, then your biological clock will speed up. You'll have a faster heart rate, jittery platelets with high levels of adrenaline, high levels of cortisol, and if you suddenly drop dead of a premature heart attack, then you have literally run out of time. And on the other hand, if you have all the time in the world, or you have a relationship with the timeless, you will have a different biological clock. And that awareness is the key to all these processes. I would like to submit to you that healing is real and it's biologically orchestrated. It's a return to the state of wholeness. It's the return to what we call homeostasis, a dynamic state of non-change in the midst of change that a naturally induced state of euphoria has biological consequences that are far beyond feeling just good. That psychological information, emotional information, information through sensory input, which was part of the great healing traditions of the world, through smell, through taste, through touch, through sound, that these are all transformed into biological information, that you can for example, if somebody tells you yes, the stock market just fell down and you have all your money or, or Madoff ran off with it, just that one little bit of information will change your biological information in a split second. And if you fall in love, that's a different kind of information as well. So your biological information is an expression of information that is generated internally and externally, that information actually, according to information theory, transcends space-time. It exists as probability clouds in a transcendent, non-local domain. And the way you ask yourself questions, the way you do science, actually gives you the kind of information that you have sought for. That information by itself is the resolution of uncertainty, which is part of our consciousness field and that the healer state of physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being modulates the biological response of the patient because there's a phenomenon called limbic resonance. My limbic brain right now is monitoring, detecting, 
and being monitored by and being regulated by and regulating your limbic brain. And our limbic brain monitors both what's happening in the external world and also in our internal world. So we are totally dependent on each other's uh, state of physical, emotional, and well-being for our own well-being. And to truly have a holistic system, we have to look at not only physical well-being, social well-being, spiritual well-being, but ecological well-being. And finally, my last postulate here, that you do in fact have a soul. It's a non-local field of intelligence that transcends space-time that, um, if you don't like the word soul, you can call a field of consciousness that is a-causal, non-local, and quantum mechanically interrelated. In one word, there's no such thing as the separate self. The separate, separate self is a socially induced and culturally induced collective hallucination. That's why the great wisdom traditions, Buddha said, if you want to heal yourself, take on divine attributes, loving kindness, compassion, joy at the success of others, and equanimity, and you will be healed. Thank you.